Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I'm so happy that you guys could join me as opposed to watching the KSI uh, web conference. That's so kind of you to come and watch some biology. Um, today, I'm going to be going over some protein and enzyme stuff. So hopefully uh, you as a year 12 have maybe just started doing some of this stuff and you're looking to just make sure that you've consolidated everything. So I will get started by showing you my screen and then we'll start talking about some biology. If I can remember how to do that. There we go. How are you guys all doing though? Hopefully you guys are all good. I can see that there's quite a few of you already looking at this, already commenting. It's nice for you lot to all be here again. Um, no, no, no one's saying hi to me though. Everyone's just talking about KSI and Logan. How sad. Oh, well, I'll get started. Um, so, oh, yay, Fasma. Yes, lovely. Um, Aisha, I'm far too old to care about who either of these people particularly are, although I did used to subscribe to KSI when I was younger, but I'm quite old and stopped caring. Um, hi, guys. Thank you for being there. <laughs> um, so, in case you don't know who I am, uh, in case this is one of the first webinars you've watched, that is me, that lovely picture there where someone's taken me mid-sentence and I clearly haven't ironed my shirt, that is me. Um, I'm the head of biology at Snap Revise. I have a degree in biology. I've studied for quite a long time and then I became a teacher and I've been teaching A-level for about four years. So I know this stuff pretty well at this stage. Um, excellent, I'm glad that you guys are all saying that you're in year 12 or year 13 and it's just, you're either here to revise or whatever else. Person saying, why did I pick biology? Because it's the best subject ever. Um, I'm in year 14 interested how that works out but cool um right in case you don't know what's going on with these web classes in case you really are new to the block um i'm sort of planning for this to be more of a recap i'll just move my face so you can't see me as much um i'm planning for this to be a sort of recap going over the key points looking at exam technique and of course you guys can ask questions which you are currently kind of doing and sort of talking amongst yourselves on that's fine um Person who's only just started enzymes today, hopefully this will be really helpful. How long is this revision session thing? I keep planning on making it about an hour. They, they tend to go over a little bit, but I'm gonna try really desperately to go over by, uh, to not go over, to stick to an hour. I've even got a watch here look, just to try and make sure that I don't go over by too much. Um, okay, so let's begin then. Uh, just so you know as well, before I do actually begin, we have a free account for one of you. So these web classes that you're seeing at the moment, they won't be free forever. So for those of you that want to get sort of as much as you can out of this, um, if you are willing to follow us on Instagram and post a picture of you having a great time doing one of these web classes, we'll give one lucky person a free account to Snap Provise 2.0. Um, also, if you stick around to the end, I've got a lovely coupon for you, which you can use up until this evening. I think up until 12 o'clock so you can get a bit of a discount. Um, I'm glad some of you are excited by this. I was thinking you were keen. I set this up on YouTube about half an hour ago and I saw about 30 of you already watching, despite nothing really happening, but interesting. Um, anyone else saying anything more? No, I'll move on. Uh, right, so as I like to do every single time, because I am a stickler for my own traditions, I have a pyramid of success for you. So I'd like you to have a go, uh, starting at the bottom, at uh, this question here. I want to see what you guys already know about enzymes. So this is kind of GCSE-esque, getting a little bit harder as we work our way up. So <laughs> there's a year seven here, oh dear. Um, if you can tell me what a substrate is, that is my first question. I'm gonna look at my comments to see what you guys come up with. So who can tell me what a substrate is? I'll have a drink. Odor. Um, substrate, fi uh, ooh, substrate first into enzyme. Lovely. Binds to an enzyme. The reactant. Not sure about rea uh, reactant, kind of. I guess I see that because it sort of gets broken down. Uh, what binds to the active site? Enzyme joins to it. Will I go over inhibitors? Good answer to what does substrate mean? Yes, I'll go over inhibitors. Um, lovely. So a substrate is, uh, let's come up with a better definition. I'd say it's kind of like a biomolecule, um, which is broken down by an enzyme something or it's, it's a biomolecule that fits to the active site and is broken down by an enzyme. Here, I'm not going to bother writing that down because I don't have enough space, but that's what I would say a substrate is. Um, can anyone tell me, let's see, let's see if you remember your year seven and year eight science. Year seven, kid, maybe you could be quite helpful here. 
Um, could you tell me what are enzymes important for? What are enzymes important for? Who can tell me? They are proteins. Am I going over inhibitors? Yes. Uh, metabolic reactions. Lovely. So an enzyme is indeed important for metabolism. So metabolism being all of your uh, reactions that sort of go on in your body all of the time. Uh, photosynthesis. Lovely. Reducing activation energy. Lovely. I'm going to talk about that soon. Biological catalyst. Chemical reactions. Uh, they are unused in reactions, but not being used up. So they're not used up. They are definitely used. Um, catalyze metabolic reactions, lower activation energy. Lovely. I like all this. So enzymes, um, in case you've forgotten, which I don't think you have, they are those little sort of biological machines that break down big things into little things um, in, in terms of like metabolic reactions and stuff like that. Uh, lovely. Let's have a look at this next one. So what is a polymer? Uh, key biological word that always comes up. I'm actually not in year seven. Okay. Um, polymer, large complex molecule. Yes. Hamza has remembered something that I said about four weeks ago, which I'm mm -hmm. loving. Oh, my phone's buzzing. Ignore that. Um, yes. Nice. So a polymer is a large molecule made up of repeating subunits. Okay. So it's a large molecule made up of repeating subunits um, formed by many monomers. Lovely. A long chain of monomers, large molecules with many subunits. Lovely. All of them are bonded together. I think that's quite key. That these things are bonded together, these monomers. So there'll be lots of condensation reactions that form this. Um, lovely. Uh, let's have a look at this next one. Um, so what are proteins? Who tell me what proteins are? If you can tell me maybe um, the elements that make them up or tell me what um, the constituents are. Lovely. So a protein is a polymer made up of amino acids. Um, Naya, yes, lovely. I'm rich with proteins. Okay. Uh, made of amino acids, chain of amino acids, made of amino acids, amino acids. Lots of you are saying amino acids. Um, Esther is saying that it's made up of C, H, and O. There is one other thing as well, which you should be aware of. M, uh, C, H, O, and one other thing. <laughs> Taz, get out of here. Lovely nitrogen as well. Okay, so they are the chemical elements in my protein. It is made of amino acids, which repeat and are joined together by peptide bonds. There you go, there's a whole mess of words which I've sort of put together. Um, what are carbohydrates and lipids? Go on, what are these two guys made of? Who remembers? Who can tell me what carbohydrates and lipids are made from? The P is phosphorus. Uh, no, P, you don't get phosphorus in proteins very often. Uh, lovely. So carbohydrates and lipids are both made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, lipids are made of fatty acids. Whoever said that? Lovely. Carbohydrates are made of glucose. Lovely. Um, long chain to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Nice. Um, so yeah, carbohydrates repeat in subunits of glucose um, bonded together by these glycosidic bonds, whereas lipids are glycerol and fatty acids bonded together by uh, ester bonds. Okay, finally, who can remember this? Who can remi uh, remind me what the lock and key model is of enzyme action? Very much a GCSE sort of term. I'm sure lots of you remember a diagram of this more than an actual way of describing that. Enzyme enters the active site. Jane, yes, that is correct. It happens when they are complementary. Lovely. So they complement each other. They fit perfectly. They're like opposite shapes. Um, enzyme substrate complex where the shape is complementary. Nice. Substrate fits into an enzyme active site and is broken down into its products. Complement shape. Yeah, lovely, guys. You seem to know this fairly well. We're going to look at the slightly more complex model, which now exists, called the induced fit model. Um, they come together, my enzyme and my substrate. So you end up with... I don't know, something that looks kind of like that. That's kind of what it looked like. And then that gets broken down into its constituent products. Lovely. Basically, the lock and key model is um, every enzyme is kind of like a lock. Every substrate is kind of like a key. You tend to only get one key that fits in one lock. They come together and the lock does its fang to the key and it breaks it down. That's pretty much it. Can you do these around a level time? I don't know what that's talking about. Um, Lovely. The tertiary structure is obviously very, very important. Nice, guys. I'm pretty confident that you are okay with this. So what I'm going to talk about today, then, I'm, I, I like to get your brains working just quickly to make sure we're all happy. Um, enzyme substrate complexes, yes, dodgy impossibility, you're right. Um, so objectives today, 
are to understand the structure and function of an enzyme. So I'm going to talk quite a lot about the structure. I'm going to talk quite a lot about the function. Um, explain how different factors can have an effect. So by this, I mean things like temperature, pH, substrate concentration, and enzyme concentration. And then for the person who's asked me twice, which I think was Aisha, um, describe the effect of inhibitors. So there are two inhibitors that we're going to look at. Um, we'll go through how they work, what they do, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I won't bother talking about cofactors and coenzymes. That's more to do with uh, photosynthesis and respiration. I, I just won't bother with them. Um, there's one scheme of work which talks about something called the temperature coefficient as well. I'm not going to talk about that either just because it's only one board. It's really, really easy. Um, for those of you that have ever heard of that, you might have heard of a term which is Q10. If you look it up, it's basically a very easy little equation that you can use. I'm not going to talk about it any further. Um, we happy? Yes, cool. Right, guys, so the spec points then are here for you. I don't really want to go through them, but just have a quick look at some point in the future. Make sure when you're revising, you always, always refer back to these and literally just tick off the things that you can do as you are studying. Okay, it's going to make your life so much easier. Um, this is something as well that I'm not really going to talk about, but again, very easy little calculation that you can uh, look up at some point about working out the amount of hydrogen ions depending on the pH. Um, what example does this? All of these guys, it's all of them. Um, so here's the OCR one, that was AQA, just that one. This is OCR. Um, this is the thing I was talking about. There's that nice little easy equation that you can use. Someone did say OCR. Um, yep, so we're gonna talk about that stuff. Edexcel, I don't think there's much to Edexcel, which isn't in the others. I think Edexcel is the more simple one in terms of enzymes. I think sometimes it just sort of balances out like that. Um, but anyway, first part. Let's get started. Let's actually learn some A-level sorts of things. We're going to look at um, catalysis. Okay, so we're going to look at catalysts. So the first way that we sort of define a enzyme is we always define them as being catalysts. Okay, so the way a catalyst works is a catalyst is just something that speeds up a reaction without being used up. Okay, so the catalyst is the same. It speeds up a reaction. It doesn't get used up. OK, so this is a sort of diagram that everyone always seems to uh, show when you look at enzymes. Right. And essentially what it's saying is you have a certain amount of energy in a reactant and you have a certain amount of energy in a product. So this would be, say, my starch, the amount of energy in starch. This would be the amount of energy in my glucose. So you can see that there's a bit less energy in glucose, which means this is an exothermic reaction. But don't worry. Um, but essentially, to turn my starch into something different, um, you can't just quickly magic it into something. You need something called activation energy first, right? So you need something called activation energy first, which is just the kick to sort of separate this thing down, right? Um, now, with an enzyme, an enzyme lowers the amount of activation energy that you need. So the blue line is showing you an enzyme. So this blue line here is an enzyme, or it's the enzymes present. The red line is showing you an enzyme that is absent. Okay, so a really important point is that a catalyst, and we're talking about enzymes in this case, they lower the activation energy of a reaction. They mean um, that you don't quite need as much energy to get the ball rolling. Okay, lovely, yes. Yeah. So Khadija, it provides an alternative route. Um, Basically, as opposed to following this route along, it will follow this route along, okay? The way this works in terms of with um, enzymes is essentially your enzyme will come and fit something into its active site, right? That lowers the activation energy because it either means that it puts a bit of tension on it, which helps to break it down, or if it's building something up, it just holds it together nicely so it can then build it up. Okay, so catalyst flow of the activation energy, I'm going to be a little bit more specific here um, by either holding substrates together or uh, providing tension, or let's say, by or providing a force on them. Weakening bonds. That kind of says weaken and bonds. Um, provide an alternative route. Don't worry too much about that, Aisha. It's just that this route here 
is a little bit different to this route here. That's why you need to really know about it. It's more of a chemistry thing. Um, cool, that's basically it. So a catalyst uh, will lower the activation energy because the enzyme will hold my substrate in place, okay? Uh, I've said here, that they remain unchanged at the end of the reaction. So when you think about something like starch getting broken down into glucose, we start off with one thing, which is very much one way, and we finish with something which is very much the opposite. Um, in terms of an enzyme, it will come and sit in here, break the thing down without actually changing itself very much. So it will break it down. It might change shape, but that is about it. Okay. Um, there you go. Therefore, this means that one catalyst can convert many molecules of substrate to product. So you don't need to have millions of different enzymes. You only need a few of them to do the job of a million because they don't get used up themselves. Okay. Um, the PowerPoint for this session, one of my people, I'm sure will send it to you in a second. There are, there is definitely a PowerPoint for this. So hopefully someone sends that to you in a second. Okay. Um, this also is really important because as uh, as a molecule in your body, your body tends to stick at about 37 degrees. If your body gets too much hotter than that, you basically die. If your body gets too much colder than that, you basically die. So this is actually really useful um, for a biological system to be able to lower the activation energy. There you go, someone did post it for me. Um, this is really, really important because it basically means that you can um, do all of your reactions, but just at a slightly lower temperature. Okay, so this is really, really important because if you didn't have that, if you didn't have this lowered activation energy, then this reaction would need a really hot temperature and that is just not the case because we can't get too hot in biology. Okay, um, so let's have a look then. So enzymes are biological catalysts which speed up the rate of metabolic reactions. Okay, um, so essentially enzymes can do two different types of reactions. They can either do condensation or they can do hydrolysis. What do I mean? by condensation. Can anyone tell me what do I mean by condensation reactions? Uh, no, enzyme concentration can be a limiting factor and I'll explain why that is the case later, Cricket, Ray. Right? So it produces water, so condensation, lovely. So this produces water, correct. It produces H2O. Condensation, breaking bonds, don't think so. Water is produced and this is producing a chemical bond. Okay, so it produces a chemical bond. So for instance, you guys will remember um, with, if I drew, look, let's remind ourselves very quickly. Um, let's draw an amino acid. There's my amine group. Here is my variable group, that's my double bond O, that's my OH, let's draw another one. Do, 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 do. Make sure you can draw these guys. If you are um, doing your A-levels and you didn't watch my session on proteins, make sure that you can draw these really easily off the top of your head. Right, look. So if I wanted to um, make my condensation, or if I wanted a condensation reaction to happen, it's gonna take away this water Check out this magic trick. Like, I can use my little pen as a rubber without even changing it. Oh, love it. I learned something today. Um, there you go. Here is my new peptide bond, which I've just formed. It got rid of water, um, so it made some water, and that produced this chemical bond. Yeah, exactly, technology. Um, so that's the condensation reaction. A hydrolysis reaction, then, is what uh, Hamzus has just said it. So hydrolysis is going to be breaking a bond. I don't really like the word break in a bond. I'd always use the word hydrolysis, but I guess if you're defining hydrolysis, that's quite hard. Break in a bond, this uses some water. Okay, if I had H2O here, uh, H2O, I could basically rub out this, right? And then I'm gonna have one of my H's is going to join over here. So let's get rid of one of them. So that turn into a one. God, I'm so good at this now. Um, and then my OH group here, that's going to rub out and that's going to join over here. Bam. Okay. So breaking a bond, it uses water. That's pretty much it. Um, you basically lyse your molecule of water, which means spit it, and then you can add that either way. Okay. Uh, one other little idea that I want you to be aware of, and this is certainly the case that you need to know this for one of the specs, I can't remember which, but you need to be aware of something called a turnover number as well which is essentially how much stuff an enzyme can break down for every one second, okay? So a turnover number is 
let's go for the number of reactions. That little sort of hashtag symbol kind of means number of as well, or I did back in the day. Um, number of reactions per second. Okay, just in case, just because this is one of these weird biological things that no one ever seems to teach anyone. If you ever see someone do this line, that means per second, like miles per hour. It means the exact same thing as this, right? It means the same thing as number of reactions, seconds, minus one. That means the same thing. That means you're sort of uh, dividing these two. So reactions per second is the same as saying reactions, seconds, minus one, just so we know. Okay, um, what were the two molecules he joined together? Oh, he. Um, they were two amino acids, those two molecules. Did I introduce myself, by the way? I'm Ollie, for those of you who didn't know who I was. Feel free to not call me he. Um, cool. Right, anyway, guys, so they are some key little bits. That's okay, Taz, I'll let you off. These are some key little bits then about condensation, hydrolysis, and turnover. I think that you guys already know this. Hi, Louise. <laughs> I can't not see your, uh, your name as I on, but okay. Um, cool, so in terms of their structure then, this is something that people get confused about. And I see lots of marks lost here um, because people get a little bit confused with how much detail they need to go into about the structure of an enzyme. <laughs> I know it's Lon, oh, it's Ion. It actually is Ion, your name is actually Ion. That's amazing. Um, thank you, Hamza. Thank you, Unicorn Power, who doesn't know how to spell my name, and Kylie. Um, anyway, yeah. So enzymes are a large globular protein which have a specific tertiary structure, including an active site. What is really, really important is that you link this back to uh, the structure of, uh, of proteins in general. So pro uh, enzymes have this, this structure where if it isn't perfect, it won't work at all. So they have to be properly folded in a perfect way. So their structure relies, someone write this, it relies on, um, what's the first structure called? Does anyone remember? So what's the first structure of a protein called? And can anyone tell me what it means? So the structure relies on the primary structure, thank you, Roberta, which is what? How do we define primary structures? Can anyone tell me? Good. So it relies on its primary structure. My handwriting is pretty poor. Uh, it relies on its primary structure. Um, so the sequence of amino acids. Okay. It relies on its secondary structure. That little symbol there, two with that little circle means prime. Secondary structure. What was a secondary structure? What was this determined by? Abby, you have said a very good point as well. I'll get back to that in a second. It's secondary structure, which is based on chain amino acids. Yeah, but what causes these this folding, these alpha helices and these beta pleated sheets? Hydrogen bonding, lovely. So it relies on its primary structure, sequence of amino acids, the secondary structure um, based on hydrogen bonding, so H plus bonds, and its tertiary structure. Based on, what was it based on? The tertiary structure? Lovely, disulfide bridges, hydrogen bonds, lovely, using the next one, hydrophobic and hydrophilic, not bonds, interactions, Roberta, be careful with that. Um, disulfide bridges, lovely. So the structure of your enzyme is totally paramount on it having all of these things that we've discussed earlier. Um, so this is, ooh, stream of pen. So based on uh, all other bonds, or I'm just gonna write that, but you guys know not to ever write that. Um, but what's important about this is if you have something like a mutation to DNA, DNA is what ultimately codes for your protein. So you guys hopefully are all aware that you have um, this thing called transcription and translation where you turn DNA into mRNA, which gets turned into protein. Um, essentially, if you change the primary structure, then you change your order of amino acids. So just a very small change to the DNA could cause quite a significant change to your amino acids. If you change your amino acids, then your primary structure will change. If your primary structure changes, 
your secondary structure will change, your hydrogen bonds will change. If that changes, your tertiary structure uh, will all change too. And you end up having a deformed enzyme, which probably won't work. So most of the time, mutations are pretty bad. Um, yeah, so mutations, not really a good thing. Okay, it's really important that you understand this. Um, in terms of an active site, the terms that you need to get used to using is an active site uh, is complementary. So it's complementary to a specific substrate. So it's complementary to a specific substrate. Okay, um, they have to have a perfect 3D shape to come together. Okay, specific and complementary to the substrate. Lovely. Um, and this does lead to this induced fit thing that someone was talking about. Okay, I have got a very straightforward exam question, one that you're probably going to be offended by. Like this was actually in an A level back in the day. So imagine how happy these people would have been. So tell me how you're feeling with this. Um, and then I'll show you this exam question. Globular, Khadija, basically means that it forms this sort of circular sort of shape, globular. So it's the opposite of fibrous, which is like long and straggly. Um, I go way back. Lovely. Uh, lots of ones, some twos, unicorn power six. Unicorn power, I'm hoping you realise that's a bad thing, not a good thing. Uh, yeah, spherical, exactly. Uh, cricket ray, zero. Ah, oh, Escher, if you could try and tell me what you're not guessing, equally Zahira, try and tell me what you're not guessing. Um, is globular due to a quaternary structure? Not necessarily. So not all enzymes are made of uh, more than one polypeptide chain. Okay, um, guys, here is an exam question. Have a look at this. Okay, feel free for people who said they were freeze to have a go at telling me what's going on. Who can tell me? So have a look at these questions. If you want to ask me a question that you've got on your mind, which you need to understand, have a go at telling me. I'll just let you write in the answers and I'll, I'll just sort of nod and say, yes, yes, you are right. Most of what you're saying so far is right. I've seen a couple of people get it wrong. I would love this question. Yeah, I know this question is an absolute gift. I don't know. They have people who sit around at like little meetings and they basically have a chat about what they think would be a good question. Someone thought this was a good question. I'm pretty sure back in teaching days, a uh, year seven could have answered this. Um, yes, you are spot on, guys. All of you said it. A is indeed, ugh, apparently I can't get it right, though, because I'm an idiot. Um, a is a uh, substrate. We don't know anything more about it. Whereas B is the active site of an enzyme. Okay, uh, we'll take easy questions any day. Lovely. That's like year eight, end of year exam question. Yeah, cricket ray, totally agree. By the way, Ollie, that turnover number is confusing me and what spec it is. Um, Randick, turnover number is just basically the number of reactions that can happen per second. In terms of specification, I've only taught two of them and I honestly can't remember which one's in which one. So I would just recommend that you have a look back at some point and check what one you are doing and be like, oh, that is in my uh, topic. In my spec, I'll look at that. Oh, no, it's not. I'll ignore it. Ever happened. Okay. Um, right. So in this example, this is a catabolic reaction, unicorn power. Think catabolic as being cats are terrible animals. And I say that having got, I, I have a cat who I love very much, but cats do destroy stuff. Catabolic means it breaks down. Anabolic means it puts it together for the person who asked that. Okay. Um, are you able to pause and watch after I've eaten my dinner? Don't know, Jane. Possibly give it a go. You won't. I won't be live though. That's a problem. But up to you. Go go eat your dinner. I recommend having your dinner. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so mechanism of action. Then we need to sort of have an understanding of how this works. Um, before we do that, I think it's important that you have an understanding of how you get two different sort of sections of or two sort of sub. I don't know species. No, I don't know. You have two types of enzymes. So you've got one which is intracellular and you've got one which is extracellular, okay? All this means is some of them work inside a cell. So intracellular means inside of a cell. Extracellular means outside. Okay, uh, can anyone think of any examples of this? Can anyone think of an example of a uh, enzyme which would work specifically inside of a cell and an example of an enzyme that would work outside? 
who can tell me? Can someone tell? Uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you, Alicia. Uh, this is all of the different um, exam boards. It's not just one. Uh, not really helping me for people just saying random ones, but not saying what's inside and what's outside. White blood cells is inside. They're not enzymes. Tell me if it's inside or outside. Yes, lovely, Fasma. So inside, definitely something like Rubisco. Definitely intracellular. DNA helicase, definitely up here as well. Uh, amylase. So amylase inside. Think about what amylase is. So um, the biggest source of amylase that you probably have near your person right now is any saliva that's in your mouth. So if you can feel any saliva in your mouth, that is chocked full of um, amylase. So amylase is extracellular. Your body basically releases it and then pumps it into your, or pumps it out of your salivary glands or out of your pancreas. So amylase will be extracellular. Um, Essentially, the way to remember it is any digestive enzyme is probably extracellular and pretty much any other enzyme is intracellular. So amylase could go here. Um, We could go for pepsin, which is a enzyme. You could go for protease, which is basically the same thing. You could go for lipase. You could go for, what else is there? Um, can't think of anything. Well, let's go for like maltase or something. There you go. Okay. Um, thing to look out for here. What are the, where are extracellular enzymes in your blood? You don't really have many enzymes in your blood. The person earlier might have been talking about, um, maybe not actually, lysozyme. That's an enzyme which is inside of your white blood cells. So that could have been what the person was talking about. Uh, urea is nice. DNA polymerase, yeah, that'd be somewhere intracellular. Um, guys, just something to look out for. Most enzymes end in ASE. So if you ever in an exam and you see ASE, that tends to denote that that's an enzyme. Okay. If anything ever ends in OSE, that tends to mean it's a sugar. Okay. If anything has, I don't know, there, there's a few of them. Um, if it's got glyc in it or gluc in it, that means it's something to do with um, sugar as well. Um, so intracellular enzymes are just any enzyme that works inside of your body, uh, inside of your cells, sorry. Uh, Rubisco, I've already mentioned, person who said Rubisco. So anything that's inside of your cell, then uh, that's intracellular. Anything outside, that's outside. In, rub- Stop asking about Rubisco, look, there it is. There's Rubisco. There it is, nice and massive. Um, okay, so in terms of how your enzymes actually work then, um, there's something called the induced fit model. So this was something that came about not not really, really recently, um, but recent enough that biologists still talk about it as being recent. But essentially, our idea of an enzyme being this perfectly fitting thing that looks like this, which has a perfect fit and substrate in it, it's just not quite true. Um, Rubisco is an enzyme in photosynthesis, sorry, the person asking that. So it's just, it's yeah, it's just some enzyme don't worry about it it's a year 13 thing you'll 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 know a lot about it later on um so the induced fit model is essentially saying that when you have an enzyme it sort of comes together but then your enzyme will very very gradually or very um what's the word not significantly but just it will slightly change shape right so the induced fit model is essentially um the active site slightly change in shape and this is called a conformational change okay so there's a conformational change okay so i think this is really important so the induced fit model is oh there you go apparently i've written this down i forgot so when the substrate enters the active site there is something called a conformational change okay between the enzyme and the substrate so the substrate will stay the same the enzyme will change shape so enzyme substrate complex so we need to have this idea that um, when an enzyme's active site binds to a substrate, um, it will change shape. Okay, this change in shape is called a conformational change. Does anyone know why this happens? So why does it change shape? Uh, The lock and key model, yeah, just like the idea of atoms having two electrons, then eight, then eight, then eight. It's just not true. 
yes conceptually kind of true um yeah lovely so that's the idea Aisha so essentially by change in shape um we've got to go back to thinking about enzymes as either being these things that do condensation reactions building things up or hydrolysis reactions breaking things down because enzymes do both and it basically means um if we are going to break something down which is how we all traditionally look at enzymes then um by it changing shape, it basically puts a strain on the bonds. So it will change shape. So this can either put a strain on the bonds. So we could, I don't mind what bonds, so you could say hydrogen bonds. Um, this puts a strain. On the bonds, um, if it is a condensation reaction, then it just holds everything together um, or it will hold the substrate together and for the first time and i can pretty much guarantee that in every single um enzyme question that you ever see apart from one that we did earlier you need to say that you form something called an enzyme substrate complex okay um this term this is used all the time in biology an enzyme substrate complex literally means you've got an enzyme it's attached to a substrate and they have formed something called a complex. So this bad boy over here, this would be an enzyme substrate complex. It's got an enzyme here, there it is. It's got a substrate here and those two guys have uh, formed a complex together. Okay, uh, let's have a look. So lovely. Um, I said lovely and then I sort of lost the comment I was looking for. Um, yeah, Cricket Ray, you're right about what you said. So to induce tension, Jesse, yes. To apply pressure to break, break bonds, yes. Breaks the subjects, um, breaks the substrate, sorry. Make bonds in substrate weaker, yes, lovely. Distorts the bonds of substrate, yes, lovely. Um, guys, you clearly know this really, really well. So it changes shape, it puts a bit more pressure on, that helps to break it down. Um, so is a sensitive competitive non competitive binding? There is, but not yet. So another word for confirmation or change that is too long to remember. You need to remember that word, Aisha. You need to <laughs> basically stop worrying that that's too long of a word and just deal that it's a long word that you need to know. So a confirmational change is a really important word in biology. What does transition state mean? Um, where have I said transition state? I can't see where I've said transition state. Um, what is a substrate? The substrate is just the thing that's broken down. It's this guy here. So in the case of starch, it is starch. Um, right, anyway, um, so there's one other thing as well, which I don't see spoken about very often about the induced fit model, but you know how earlier I said that enzymes have to have this perfect, perfect shape caused by their primary structure, their secondary structure, their tertiary structure, all of that stuff. Um, by my enzyme having to change its shape, it means that it, it can be even more specific as well. So because of this induced fit model, it means that my substrates and my enzymes are even more perfectly suited to each other. So if my substrate was just had like a tiny little nick here, right, then my uh, induced fit model might not necessarily work properly because my enzyme might not be able to get around this sort of little bumpy thing, which I've just given it there, right? So the induced fit model, it also allows for a little bit more specificity. That's a good word. So it allows for even more specificity. Okay, um, yes, uh, da, 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 da. competitive inhibitors, I will get that, don't worry. Um, right, so this catalysis stuff, which I've written down here, I think all I meant by this was what I said earlier, that um, pressure is put onto the substrate. Okay, so some form of tension is put onto the substrate. Okay. I feel like sometimes people just say random words that are vaguely related to the topic. Yeah, I feel like you can get away with quite a lot with biology um, in terms of just saying random words, but I try possibly to not do that too much. Um, okay, cool. We are whizzing through this. So how confident are you guys feeling with this so far? So we covered um, the shape, what they do, induced fit model. We've looked at uh, primary, secondary, tertiary structure. A lot of twos. Guys, why are you saying two? What, what's making you not a one out of interest? I'm intrigued. 
that spirited away sort of thing. I don't know what that is. Guys, try and explain to me why you're a two. If you can say what you're a bit confused at, I can have a go at going over it. Just new content in general. Fair enough. Just hard, isn't it? Um, I guess it's hard. I think it's conceptually uh, a little tricky at first, but I think I think that kind of makes sense that you can basically have this kind of little enzyme thing and something will vaguely fit in it and then it just sort of changes around it and starts to push it together and break it down. I think that idea just sort of makes sense to me. Um, so what happens when the reaction is hydrolyzed? Um, hydrolyzed just means broken down, doesn't it? So you, basically you'll have the enzyme will hold it in place. There'll be some water involved in splitting down my enzyme. Um, the complex enzyme structure, yeah, I agree with that. But if you know the structure of a protein, you already know that you've got your amino acids, you've got your, uh, which is your primary structure, your sequence, you've got your secondary structure caused by hydrogen bonds, your tertiary structure caused by your other bonding. Um, can I briefly summarize what I've said? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can briefly summarize it. Um, what did I say? So let's just look at this bit here. So inside or outside, easy, induce fits, doesn't fit perfectly and the enzyme will basically change its shape a little bit put a bit of pressure on it um that is what reduced the activation energy earlier and that's about it really i don't think there's too much more to this bit um are there any disadvantages of an induced fit model i guess it's not it's not ideal if you're not the perfect substrate because you can't break everything down but that's probably a good thing because we want to have specific enzymes so not really um, tertiary structure, Jesse O, that is basically um, all of my nice little um, amino acids all folded up due to hydrogen bonds. And then you get these other little nifty bonds forming too, like your uh, disulfide bridges, your hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Um, I can't remember anything else. Ionic bonds. I think that's, that's definitely something else which I've forgotten. But yeah, that's really it. Um, Saffron, I like your analogy. Um, so no substrate is a completely perfect fit for an active site. Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly right, Esther. Um, exam question on this particular bit. Yes, it's coming. Um, does it mean one enzyme combined to more than one substrate? It kind of does daily. Oh, I've got a nice little virus thing popping up. That's nice. Um, it kind of does mean that, yes. Um, but for A-level, you basically need to get used to the fact that it's one enzyme, one substrate still. Okay, right, guys, here is a exam or here's an exam question. So describe how an enzyme such as pepsin, which is another word for protease, so say a protein enzyme, breaks down a substrate. Um, <laughs> I don't think so, Hamza, uh, especially because this is my work laptop and I literally don't use anything but this, but I'm sure you don't believe me. Um, guys, have a go at answering this question. See what kind of things you can come up with. Okay, so describe how an enzyme such as pepsin can break down a substrate. Lovely. I'm gonna wait for a few more people to say something before I write anything down because I don't want to, uh, I don't want you guys to feel like you haven't had a chance to have a go. So feel free to have a go at writing what you think. But what Fatma said was good for those of you that are wondering. So how can an enzyme break down a substrate? Uh, never write about lock and key. Never write about lock and key. Always induce fit. These are really good. So substrate goes to the active site of pepsin and then it forms an enzyme substrate complex. Good. Active site changes shape and forms a restrain in order to break the bond. So it puts strain. I wouldn't say restrain. Um, successfully collided. Oh, nice use of successfully collided. I like that. Uh, enzyme substrate complex splits into two products. Alexander Lilly, not a great answer if I'm totally honest. Um, let's go through it slowly. So describe how an enzyme such as pepsin breaks down the substrate. Guys, uh, if, if in doubt, draw a little diagram, right? Here is an enzyme, here is a substrate. Okay, step one, for this to work at all, we need to be able to say that my uh, substrate Substrate is complementary. There's meant to be an I in there somewhere. It's complementary to the active sites. Okay, if you wanted to, you could probably start talking about um, 
due to specific bonding and stuff, but the question is not really asking that, so you probably don't need to worry. Um, okay, so the substrate is complement interactive sites. We need to say that the two successfully collide. I like that, uh, I think Abby wrote this. So the two successfully collide, right? Essentially that means that this little substrate here has to hit the right spot. Right. If it were to hit it there, not really going to be very successful. If it hits it there, not successful or there. It's got to hit the right bit, uh, spot. So the two need to successfully collide. Okay. Um, lots of you started saying the next thing. So once they have collided successfully, we need to say the active site. And then the word that Aisha said was too long to remember. The active site undergoes... A, what was the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Abby, I'm glad your teacher has because you'll probably never forget to say it. So the active site undergoes what? What do we need to say? Conformational change, yes, Taz. So it undergoes a conformational change. Okay, uh, let's say um, put in tension. Put in tension on the bonds within, um, because it's pepsin, let's say, within a protein. Okay. Um, yes, it was conformational change. Um, okay. Uh, this is called, why don't we say, um, this is the induced fit theory. Oh, not that, not the. Ooh, there you go. This is the induced fit theory. Um, what else could we say? After that's happened and we've got this change, um, what's this called? Is the enzyme pepsin breaking dipeptide bonds? Yes, cricket ray. Um, is this the last bit? No, it's not quite the last bit. Sorry, Aisha. Um, talk about lock and key unless it's specifically asked for induced fit. Fair enough. Um, Freya, I guess you could talk about lock and key as well if you wanted to at this point. Um, I probably wouldn't because I've seen the mark scheme and it doesn't need it. But we need to say this forms before we talk about a product, this forms, I've had my nice little change of shape. In fact, let's not even draw it like that. Let's draw it properly. Uh, this forms, ooh, there you go, my enzyme substrate complex. So it's a five mark question. Okay, forms an enzyme substrates complex. Um, forms an enzyme substrate complex. Uh, after we've had that, uh, we can basically say um, my product will leave the active site. Product leaves AS, AS, active site. Okay, yeah, Molly Brown. Um, I still find it bizarre to see your name because I talked to someone called Molly Brown. Uh, you could very easily talk about uh, lowering activation energy here. So at this point here, if you wanted to, you could get another mark for saying uh, lowering activation energy. How weird would it be if I, if, if you, Molly, were the actual student at all? I take it probably not, because I feel like I would hear about this. Um, lowering activation energy. Yeah, that is a good point. Uh, active site, sorry, AS active site. I was trying to make myself laugh. Um, Yes, yes, Abby, I am going to do that. I am, yes. Okay, that's everything that you guys would need to say in this question. So look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different points you could say. They're kind of what your marks would be. Um, what did I get in my A levels, Ollie? I got an A in biology. I got a B in history. No, I didn't. A in biology, A in history, B in chemistry. And then I did a little bit of maths as well. But back in my day, you could give it up after AS. Yeah, good times. Uh, anyway. Final few little bits. So I'm going to try and whiz through these. So in terms of the rates of uh, catalysis, this is basically saying what affects the rate of reaction. This is identical to um, what you did at GCSE. No different at all. So the rate can be increased by increasing an enzymes, uh, increasing enzyme slash substrate concentration until something called saturation occurs. So this is a little bit wrong, this graph here. So this one here should say rate of reaction. This one here, I don't know why it says this. 
um, sorry, this should say either enzyme slash um, substrate concentration. Maybe I should have concentrated harder. So saturation is basically um, the absolute maximum amount of stuff that you can have. Okay. Um, good luck, Remy. Uh, so in terms of what's going on in this graph, as I increase, let's do the first one. Let's do enzyme concentration first. As I increase my enzyme concentration, it will initially increase my, increase my rate of reaction. All right, so I reckon you could split this graph into two. So you have part A and part B. You can always do this with an exam question as well. You can always split your graph into two parts. Okay. Um, part A is showing that as I increase my enzymes, then I am going to increase my rate. Part B, as someone said, this is a plateau, which is spelled like that. Plateau means um, it's kind of leveled out. It doesn't matter how much more you increase your enzyme. I could literally quadruple it at this stage and my rate's going to be the same because something else is limiting it. Um, so is there a time delay? Of, uh, right, I'm going to ignore that. So in terms of what's going on then, for my enzymes, if I've got a higher conk or higher concentration, higher conk equals higher rate of reaction. However, after a certain point, after uh, we have too many enzymes, basically um, there won't be enough substrates to fit in my enzymes anymore. So the reaction can't carry on going at the same rate. Okay. So as soon as I've got too many enzymes, think about all your nice little enzymes going along that look like this, right? Let's say I've got a million of my enzymes and I've only got like two of my substrates. It doesn't matter how many enzymes I have because I can only fit uh, my two substrates into two of those one billion enzymes, whatever I said. So the higher concentration um, leads to a higher rate. However, uh, ultimately, um, every active site will get filled. Every, in fact, is it every active site? No, it's not, it's gonna be the other way around. Sorry, every, every substrate, will be in the enzymes or in the, so that's terrible, the, in the active sites and the rate can't carry on increasing. The rate can't increase any further. Probably not enough room here. I hope that makes sense. So the way I sort of used to think about this back in the day was imagine that I had an unlimited number of people and 10 chocolate bars, right? Um, the more people you have, the quicker you can eat those chocolate bars. But as soon as you get up to a certain number, you just have too many people to eat that, those chocolate bars any quicker. Like you can only have, I don't know, one person per chocolate bar, maybe two per people per chocolate bar. At that point, you can't really increase the rate any further. Um, yes, you can draw diagrams, that person is right. Okay, so guys, think about it like that. So your enzymes are kind of like little people. If you had a billion people and 10 chocolate bars, that would finish off those chocolate bars really quickly. If you had 10 chocolate bars and one person, that would be quite slow. But at some point between one and a million or one and a billion people, you're going to reach an absolute maximum rate of eating that chocolate bar. Okay, so the same is true with substrates then. So at a higher concentration of substrates, um, you get a higher rate of reaction. But this time, instead of thinking of having a billion people eating 10 chocolate bars, think of it as having 10 people eating a billion chocolate bars. So the opposite way around. At some point, when you get so many chocolate bars, those people can't quite keep up with the, the amount they're eating anymore. So you can no longer break down your uh, substrate very quickly. Okay, so basically you're going to end up forming um, more enzyme substrate complexes up until the point where you can't actually form any more because there aren't enough enzymes. So ultimately, um, enzyme numbers, so enzymes will limit the number of enzyme substrate complexes. 
I'm going to write ESCs for short. Okay, so enzyme substrate complexes. So ultimately, the enzymes will limit the number of enzyme substrate complexes. Okay, um, this is really bad handwriting. So the enzymes, every substrate will be in the active sites and the rate can't increase any further. Um, I want to read what you guys are saying just because I don't want you guys to get confused with this. Um, yeah, you are allowed to draw uh, diagrams. They sometimes ask you to. Um, do, do, do. Didn't get a part where the enzymes undergoing conformation will change, change shape. Do, 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 do. So Randick or Randich or how you say your name, um, basically you have a little change in shape and that just puts a bit more pressure onto your bond. That's it. It just makes it a little easier to break it. Um, so when it plateaus, the enzyme concentration is a limiting factor. Uh, yeah. So uh, kind of. If I've if we're looking at oh hang on, let's get rid of one of these. So if we get rid of enzymes, right? And this is looking at the enzyme, con sorry, the substrate concentration. Um, at this point here, at A, at A is my substrate, which is limiting the rate of reaction. At B, it will be something else. Because it doesn't matter that I have any more substrate, the rate isn't increasing any further. Okay, it's the opposite way around if you were to change that to enzyme. How do you draw these diagrams? Um, they would just be expecting you to draw a diagram that looks something as basic as this. Right, that's all the kind of diagrams they'd want you to be able to say. It doesn't, I don't think you'd ever really need to say it because you could probably describe it as well. Um, does rate decrease? No. So this is important. So with enzyme slash substrate concentrations, uh, you never will get this decrease in rate. Okay, it will always just stay perfectly um, at the top it can get to. Uh, I'd study biology, the person who's just asked that. Okay, um, this word saturation, uh, let's say that this occurs. Saturation occurs um, when the enzyme is at uh, its maximum operation or something. Does anyone remember the term I said for the maximum like turnover we can have? So this occurs when the enzyme is at its maximum ooh, rate. Optimum, it wasn't optimum, not efficiency. Plateau, well, not plateau. I said it really early on. So it's the absolute fastest where it's like the perfect number it can do per second, not saturation points. Mm, I've managed to catch some of you out. Yes, Louise. Um, yeah, so this is its turnover number. Okay, so all I do for this kind of thing is I just think about how um, if you have far too many enzymes, you'll have loads of enzyme substrate complexes forming. But if you have too many enzymes, there won't be enough substrates to fill every enzyme. Okay, and the opposite is true the other way around. So if you have loads of substrates, you'll have loads of enzyme substrate complexes, but you won't have enough enzymes to come to terms with the number of substrates. Okay, Q10, I'm not going to talk about. Q10, yes. Q10, don't worry. I'm just going to keep saying Q10. Q10, don't worry. Q10 is really straightforward. Um, why is it the maximum rate? Is it kind of the same as optimum then? Yeah, it is kind of the same as optimum. Uh, right, guys, this is probably what you have seen before at GCSE. This is really basic, so I'm just going to very quickly talk over it. So in terms of temperature, essentially what you've got is you've got an increase in temperature down here, causing an increase in rate. Um, the reason for that is what? Why is it the case that as we increase temperature, we get um, an increase in rate? What is going on? What is there more of if there's a greater temperature? Yes, Sada. So increase in temperature equals more kinetic energy. Kinetic just means movement. So more kinetic energy and you basically have a faster rate of reaction. Okay, too much kinetic energy is bad and it rattles about so much that it denatures. Um, lovely, so you get more successful collisions. Uh, exactly, let's say that too. More successful, oh, mo, oh dear. More successful collisions. Okay, the optimum temperature is this little line coming down here. So right there. That is my optimum temperature. So that is where um, you have, have the greatest rate. So optimum temperature equals the greatest rate. However, 
The problem with this is um, if you get basically any hotter than the optimum, then you basically have something called denaturing, which happens. Okay, yeah, you guys mostly saying that this is at 37 degrees. That used to get you a mark at GCSE. It doesn't tend to at A level, and it tends not to be very true either. Amylase's optimum temperature is above 37. Um, lovely. So denature, we need to say, um, so too much, too much Ke kinetic energy. Uh, we could say um, bonds break, bonds break, and we could say the um, active sites change the shape. which means that it's denatured. Denature literally means it's lost its very nature. It can't do its thing. Okay. Um, breaks bonds and tertiary structure of the enzymes at site. Yeah, Mariam, lovely. So if you could say that this is broken, say the, I don't know, the hydrogen bonds holding together the tertiary structure, that would be lovely. That's a really good way to talk about it. Activation energy, no, I probably wouldn't talk about it here. Um, cool, don't understand optimum temperature. Basically, this is the temperature when the enzyme works perfectly. So that temperature, it's just got the right amount of... Um, kinetic energy to work as quickly as possible. Sorry, I am going to do um, <laughs> inhibition, I promise. Um, pH, very, very similar. Um, basically, you have an optimum pH right down in the middle. This varies for different enzymes. So proteases, if they're in your stomach, work best at a fairly low pH, as you'd expect. Um, essentially, with the pH, um, you need to know that pH is a measure of hydrogen ions, their concentration, uh, that little symbol there, that means concentration for anyone who doesn't know. So it's a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions. Essentially the difference is, is small changes um, and you don't have a mass, you don't, if, if, if there's a tiny change in pH, you can just about deal with it. Um, so you might lose a bit loss of, um, I don't know, how can we word this? Loss of, some structure, but not entirely. So it might change enough that the active site doesn't fit as perfectly, but because of the induced fit model, it can still bind and it can still um, form, so it can still metabolize something, still do something. However, if there is a large change, um, this will break your bonds. So it'll break the bonds, um, alter in, alter in 3D structure. of active site, which means it denatures again. Okay, so don't worry about um, kinetic energy here. It's just about if the pH is wrong, then the 3D shape will ultimately change. Um, da -da -da. If there's a low pH, then the negative ionic bonds are pulled apart and broken, while a high pH, positive ionic bonds broken. What determines the optimum then? Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, you're essentially right. Basically, the amount of hydrogen ions can basically get in the way of certain things or the uh, hydroxide ions can get in the way if you've got uh, too high of a pH. Don't worry too much about it. That's more of a chemistry. So I've never seen a question about that ever. You just need to have some idea that you have this change of shape. Um, yeah, I guess you could talk about that cricket, Ray. I guess you could. I've never really seen people do it too much. Um, okay, final part that someone wanted me to talk about then was inhibitors. So inhibitors are these really sort of, how? When do the hydrogen ions increase or decrease according to the pH scale? Remy, hydrogen ions are basically the things that cause something to be acidic. So the more hydrogen ions, the more acidic it is, the lower the pH. Um, not very much, Freya, sorry. I don't know why I'm apologizing, but it's, it's, you've got a tiny bit left. So the last thing we need to talk about then is uh, inhibitors. So inhibitors slow down the rate of enzyme controlled reaction. Okay, they always, always slow it down. They are always something that slows it down. This is the thing that you'll get the most uh, questions on in an exam because it basically, A-levels uh, A want you to not just know stuff, but be able to apply it to a new situation. And this is a perfect way of doing this. So the two types of inhibitors uh, that you have are a competitive inhibitor, or you have a non-competitive inhibitor. So if my enzyme looks something like this, then uh, let's say this is my normal substrate that fits into it. A competitive inhibitor is something which has a very similar shape to my substrate. So maybe it looks like, I don't know, 
something like that. Essentially, what this means is that uh, there is a, a high likelihood that my competitive inhibitor, this guy, will bind to my active site naturally. So this guy could have a successful collision with my enzyme and bind to it. And if that happens, you can't form an enzyme substrate complex anymore because this thing has bound up my enzyme. Okay, so a competitive inhibitor is an inhibitor which has a similar shape to the substrate and can bind to the enzyme. Okay, um, essentially when that happens, so this is showing you a competitive inhibitor here. This dark blue line in the middle, which I'm sort of, that one, don't know why I've drawn another arrow. Um, it shows you the effect of it. So ultimately, you will get to the same rate of reaction, right? So ultimately, you get to the same rate of reaction. However, it just takes more time. So this reaction only took this amount of time to get there whereas this one needed a little bit longer to get to that same rate. So competitive inhibitors are good um, because they will basically slow down your rate of reaction and uh, they, won't, they won't totally destroy your enzyme, stop it from working. Uh, lots of drugs, um, so lots of anxiety and depression medications will use an inhibitor along these lines to work. If, if they basically will bind up to an enzyme and stop it working as quickly. So that's how anti-depression tablets work. Um, what are you guys saying? So yeah, inhibitors can stop a reaction from continuing on. Uh, it's used in paracetamol to stop pain. Yes, exactly. So it, um, paracetamol and most uh, analgesics, which are things that stop pain, uh, they basically stop your synapses from releasing certain things or from reuptaking them or something, and they bind to the enzyme that breaks it down. So acetylcholine esterase is one of them. Um, Let's look, how is a reaction is happening if it doesn't break bonds? I'm confused. So this little guy here then, my competitive inhibitor, it will bind to some of the enzymes, but not bind to all of them. So let's say I've got a little pot, right? And I've got 10 enzymes in there. So I've got 10 enzymes. I've got, uh, let's say 1000 substrates. And I've got like five inhibitors. Ooh. Essentially, my 10 enzymes will be binding to my substrates, but some of them will bind to an inhibitor instead. So the reaction will still go on because there probably won't be as many inhibitors as there are substrates. So the reaction will still go on, it's just it will slow down a little bit. Okay, um, what is the inhibitor called for depression and anxiety? I can't remember. Um, it'll have a long biological name, but if any of you take them, you'll, you'll probably have the words in front of you. So this graph is showing you at this point, we're just looking at these two bits at the top. This is the, um, the rate of reaction if you just have a normal enzyme. If you include an inhibitor, a competitive inhibitor, uh, it still gets to the same point, still gets to the same point. It just takes a little bit longer, okay? With a non-competitive inhibitor, basically what happens is a non-competitive inhibitor will destroy your enzyme. It binds to something called the allosteric site on an enzyme, which is basically like the back of it. Um, it will bind to the back of it. It causes the active site to change shape and then the active site can't work at all. So in this graph here, uh, this is showing you a non-competitive inhibitor because the rate of reaction is just stopping or it's getting to a certain point and just like, it's not actually stopping. It's getting to a certain point and not increasing because all of the enzymes have broken down essentially. Okay, um, so we can say for a non-competitive inhibitor, um, they bind to the, don't want to spell it strong, allosteric site, allosteric. They bind to the allosteric site of an enzyme, and I'll show you what that means in a second. And they cause the active site to change shape preventing enzyme substrate complexes forming. 
Okay, I guess we could say similar shape to substrate confined to enzyme, um, preventing as many. enzyme substrate complexes. You really need to use this word in every single answer about enzymes, enzyme substrate complex. Uh, if it changes the shape, can't it bind to another substrate? No, if it changes the shape, it can't bind to anything anymore. <laughs> Randick, I like your uh, response. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Yes, Georgie, that's exactly right. Um, I think all we need to know about enzymes for A levels. Uh, what example is this? Ugh, this is all of them, keep saying that. So guys, here you go. Here's a nice little diagram of this going on then. So non-competitive inhi inhibitors. Uh, if this is a competitive inhibitor, look, here it is. The competitive inhibitor will bind to the active site and my substrate can no longer fit in anymore. That's what it's meant to be showing you, okay? So uh, this enzyme might not be able to break anything down for a while, but if a competitive inhibitor were to move along, then uh, it could possibly start working together and it could carry on. It'd just be a bit slower. Um, so basically the... Uh, allosteric sites, this one, this is basically any site of the enzyme which is not the active site. And if something binds to it, it changes the active site shape. So the allosteric site is, uh, let's say, it is separate to the active site. That's pretty much all you need to know. And in terms of a non competitive inhibitor, it um, uh, changes 3D structure um, preventing ESCs. Yeah, we could say it denatures them. And I think that's pretty much what we need to say. So uh, allosteric sites, hopefully I've responded to that. Enzyme inhibitor complex, yes, this is true. So basically this little guy here then, this is called an enzyme um, inhibitor complex because it's got two of them. Can a competitive inhibitor leave the active site and allow substrates to attach? Um, to my knowledge, yes, it can do that. Um, did the induce fit? Couldn't the enzyme change shape again? Uh, this this is sort of implying it changes shape so significantly that it can no longer do that. So look, this active site is now completely not going to fit this. Um, how, so if the active site is specific, why is it still complementary to the competitive inhibitor? If the active site is specific, why is it still complementary to the competitive inhibitor? That's not very specific. No, Fatima, good point. Um, this is because we purposefully make drugs that are very similar to substrates. So if any of you want to do pharmacology, which hopefully lots of you do, you will essentially be looking at an enzyme very, very specifically. And you do things called crystal um, x-ray crystallography, where you look at it and you see, oh, this is exactly what the substrate would look like for it, because this is the exact shape of the active site. So I'm going to build this drug, which exactly mirrors that. And we're clever enough at science that we can do that. So it, you're right, it, is, it's, it doesn't seem very specific, but it's because we're very clever. Um, how does the allosteric site change the shape of the active site? It basically disrupts a whole load of bonds. So by something binding there, it will it will cause certain bonds to be broken, changing the 3D shape. Uh, does the concentration of substrate influence inhibitor? Like if you have a lot of substrates compared to a few inhibitors, yes. So the more substrates you have, the less of an impact an inhibitor will have. If you have like one to one ratio, then it's not going to have as much effect. If the non-competitive inhibitor leaves the enzyme, does the enzyme regain its form? Um, not with non-competitives, no. I don't understand this. Can you repeat it, please? Yes, of course. Um, thought he was going to say crystal meth then. Not crystal meth, no. Um, pharmacology looks boring. Pharmacology is not boring. My bro does x-ray crystallography. That's very cool, my run. Um, good, it is cool. I agree, it is cool. And it's okay to be nerdy. It's okay to think this is cool. Um, so yeah, to quickly go over it then, a competitive inhibitor binds to the active site and it will basically prevent a substrate from binding. It prevents an enzyme substrate complex. A non-competitive inhibitor binds to the allosteric site on the back and that causes the active site to change shape because it will disrupt some bonding. And that means that uh, you basically can't function anymore, which is why you have this sort of graph, right? It will just stop the enzyme from working. Okay, the reason that as you increase substrate concentration, it will basically work a bit faster is because the more substrate you have as a ratio to the amount of um, inhibitor, the less of an impact you see. Okay, 
let me know how you feel with this because this is basically the end now. This is all you need to know about enzymes, yeah. Apart from um, daily Dawa, you need to know lots of names of different ones. So you, uh, by the time you get to some DNA technology stuff, you'll need to know the names of quite a few. Okay, lots of twos, some ones. Nice, Randic flow, that is lovely of your teacher. Is it reversible? So I think competitive inhibitors are, but non-competitors aren't. We might need to Google that because I can't remember if I've actually said that. <laughs> okay, um, right, guys, I've got a little exam question here for you. And it was probably a bit stupid of me to put this one in here because I can't really do it. Um, but just so you can see this, uh, this is a common exam question. So they ask things like, a student is investigating the initial rate of reaction, um, breaking down hydrogen, um, so it's an, it's an enzyme called catalase, which is quite an important one. Um, basically, the volume of oxygen collectible is recorded over a period of 140 seconds, the results are shown in figure 2.1. Use the information to calculate the initial rate of reaction in centimetres cubed per second, right? As, as I said earlier, that means the same as that. Okay, um, for anyone, you can't see it very well. I'm sorry that's a bit blurry if that is the case. Uh, hopefully you can download it and you might have a better copy. Yes, Taisha, I, I've gathered that you find this blurry. Um, basically, if you wanted to do a question like this, if you ever get asked to work out a rate, um, the way you do it, and as I said, it's stupid of me to do it because I can't do it, is you basically need to find a tangent. So if you guys remember from like circle theory at GCSE, a tangent is just a straight line coming off of it. So if we're looking at the initial rate, you have to get your uh, tangent right off of this zero as close as possible. And I'm going to suck at this. So look how not straight that is. That's rubbish. I'm going to have another go. Um, but you'd get a ruler and you would draw a perfect line. I'm sure there's a way of me doing this, but I can't really. Um, not very well anyway. And essentially what you would do is you have to look at your change in your y-axis, which is often called uh, dy, over your change in your x-axis. So this is gonna be the wrong answer. And I'll tell you what the right answer is, those of you um, who've done it. Uh, my change in my Y, let's have a look. So let's go from zero up to five. My change in my Y is five. My change in my X is at zero up to five. My change in my X goes from here. So it comes down this line here, down to there. Each of these boxes will have two, so that's five over 18. Uh, if I do that my calculator, because I have a calculator, uh, apparently that is, oh, that's not actually too far off is 0.28 I get if I do that. Um, that would be your answer in centimeters cubed per, sorry, centimeters cubed per second, right? Uh, the actual answer that I have worked out with a ruler was actually 0.25. Okay, but just be aware that you get asked to do that quite a lot. A lot. Uh, where is the ruler? I don't have a ruler. Um, for those of you who said that I was a calculator, that I actually have a calculator, um, cool. That's one type of exam question. This is the last one I wanted to show you. And then I was going to sort of finish this off. So washing powders often contain enzymes from bacteria. Okay, that is true. Biological enzymes, non-bio means not from organisms. Um, these enzymes include proteases that hydrolyze proteins in clothing stains. The graph shows the effect of temperature on a protease that could be used in washing powder. Okay, so I've got... Um, percentage of maximum protease activity. So at 60 degrees, you can see it's not really worked. 50 degrees, mm, not great. 30 degrees, pretty good. So explain the shape of the curves at 50 and 60. Um, when do you stop drawing the line in the last question? It doesn't matter, Kalinda, you can just stop drawing it whenever you want to. I would just stop drawing it at a place that's sensible. So when I get out to a number like seven, so I don't have to think too much. I did explain. I, Mm, no, no. MK Ulster boy, I did not expose myself. Let's not go around saying that. Um, Saskia, it doesn't matter when you stop drawing them. Uh, so in terms of this question then, so washing powders can often contain blah, 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 blah. Explain the shapes of the curve 50 and 60. Uh, yes, so perfect. So we need to say for both 50 and 60, um, so at 50 and 60, we could say the enzyme has denatured. If we are explaining the shape of the curves, we probably want to talk about any differences. 
So we want to say which one is faster, which one is slower. The optimum temperature looks like it's probably 30, agreed. What example does this question? I can't remember. I take them from a, a range of them. I basically brought up a massive, massive database of them of like thousands of questions over the last couple of years. Uh, which one is worse? Which temperature is worse? We can say this. 50 is steeper than 60, I think. It's definitely not. So this is definitely steeper here than that one. So yeah, 60, lovely. So what's the difference then? At 60 degrees, there is more what? So denaturing happens faster at 60. Because. So this explain, explain means say why, in case you've never seen that, that's a terrible worry. Say why. Uh, denature is faster than at 60. Good, good, well done, you two. Um, due to more kinetic energy, It looks like mo kinetic energy due to more kinetic energy. If there's more kinetic energy, what's going to happen? Good, Fatima, um, more hydrogen plus or hydrogen bonds break. More hydrogen bonds break, or we could say ionic bonds. That's also fine. Um, so this changes the active sites. Changing the active sites, or we could say the 3D structure, or we could say the tertiary structure. Let's say all of those things. Tertiary structure, what can't we form? Thing we always have to say. Can you also say disulfide bridges? Probably. It doesn't say it on the mark scheme in front of me, but you could probably say it. If you said all of them, that's what I would do. Lovely fewer enzyme substrate complexes form. Done. That's pretty much it. Um, what else did it say? Yeah, no, that's pretty much it. That's what you need to say to get your four marks on this question. Okay, what is explained, say why. So not say what's happening, say why it happened. So according to this, it's best to wash clothes at 30. Um, yes, Aisha, according to this one tiny bit of scientific data, it's best to wash your clothes at 30. Um, don't ever think that that means that it's better to wash your clothes at 30 degrees all the time. Don't go and tell your mom or your dad or your siblings or whoever, oh, uh, Ollie Vaughan from YouTube told me that I have to wash clothes at 30 because he showed me a graph of it, because that's not true. This is just one tiny bit of evidence. Okay, um, right, that'll do. Um, so guys, for those of you who have seen this before, I'll very quickly talk you through this. So on the 16th of October, for you lucky people, um, Snap provides 2.0 will be live. You are very lucky to have this. I would have, <laughs> I would have been very happy to have this back when I was a kid because I had very little or very few resources to learn my A-level biology, which sucked. Um, discard all of my pen so no one can ever see it again. Uh, if I show you this, uh, where were we at? Here we go. So this is Snap Provise 2.0. Pick a subject. Um, you basically do a little test. Then we'll send you a whole load of videos, which will basically come up with nice little tests for you to show you what you do and don't know. Um, you have loads of self-marking quizzes. You have lots of beautiful revision guides. I may have just copied what I said. Um, there'll be some exam technique videos. There'll be some exam questions, which are easy, medium, and hard. You get some points. You can talk to people like me. Look, this is gonna be me. Look, it says the student name, that could be you. You could be Nick Smith and I could be Kate Thompson. Uh, I'll answer your questions and then you'll get some support by these web class we've just done. Oh, look, there's DYDX. Look, how weird is that? That's what I literally just said. Um, so that is Snap Provise 2.0. Um, so that comes on the 16th of October. Um, as well as that, check out our videos, Gun Snap Provise, as you found this. But here is the one that I'm currently doing. Here is my one that I'm, I don't know, that's weird. There's two of them apparently that I'm doing. That's bizarre. Um, but look, here's stuff I'm doing later on. Here's something I'm doing about aerobic respiration and ATP. Uh, you can look at all our other videos. Um, make sure that you are setting reminders so it pops up so you don't forget it. Um, and then, yeah, that's basically it, to be honest. So here are the packages. For those of you who want to know more about this, this is the, the big boy package, which will help you have people like me teach new stuff. This is what you possibly might get if you like us on Instagram and do whatever you have to do on Instagram. Um, but anyway, that's what you'll get. If you bought any of these other packages, you'll basically get an, a, a discount upgrade if you buy it sooner rather than later. 
Um, here is your code for those of you that wanted the code. Use that up until tonight. You'll save yourself some money. Um, you hopefully have an idea of what you're getting as well at this stage. And finally, you should now know the structure and function of enzymes, including the active sites. Understand how different factors affect the rate of enzymes. And finally, understand how inhibitors work. Guys, if you have any questions, um, not questions about price, because I don't know the answers to that, um, I'll have a good answer in them. Are there many job opportunities for biology graduates? Uh, yes and no. Depends what you want to get into. If you want to be a scientist, obviously there's lots of jobs. If you want to be a teacher or something, there's lots of jobs. Um, I think studying science is quite good because it shows you it shows that you're quite clever and you can do quite a lot of graduate entry things with biology, but it's ultimately got to be what you enjoy. If you enjoy doing biology, do it at university. If you don't, then don't do it at university. Um, if you already have it, you have to pay. No, you don't. Uh, I'll leave that code up for you, Vega. Um, thanks so much. I understand most of this just need to revise a bit more. Yeah, I think that's ultimately uh, the right thing to do. You just need to carry on revising all the time. Um, show us your cat, Ollie. That sounds weird. Um, hang on, I might have a picture on my phone. I would go and grab him, but he is currently outside. Uh, my cat is, let's see if you can see this. There's my cat. Yeah. He is called Sam. He is a good cat. Um, buy medical science jobs, yeah, exactly. Uh, how huge discount are we talking? 40% quick maths or says that out there. Uh, what did I do at uni? I did biology at uni. Thank you for enjoying my cat. He's very cool. He's called Samwise because I'm a nerd and I like Lord of the Rings. Um, I did biology at uni, person he's just asked. Um, guys, if you have no question, all gone. Uh, there's still one question that you that I don't understand because you said it forms tension to the bond. I knew you were going to ask that. So, yeah. So essentially, um, when you have your induced fit model, your enzyme will come together with your substrate and the change in shape, the conformational change, will put a little bit more pressure onto your hydrogen bonds, onto your ionic bonds, which causes them to be more likely to break down. So an enzyme substrate complex does form a, a bit more pressure or a bit more um, tension. So if I say, if I contradict myself and said that uh, the induced fit model does, but enzyme substrate complexes don't, I don't think I meant to. It basically, um, it does. Okay. Um, what else? Substrate to be split into products. Perfect, lovely. You need to be kicked out, lovely. I thought I was on about something else. Someone's hard. Lovely, right guys, in which case, I feel like everyone is done and probably all tired and want to go and catch up on whatever you guys were talking about earlier. I'm going to head off. So I think, hope you've had a nice time tonight. Um, I think there's lots of careers available, but I've got a career, so I guess I'm, I guess I'm biased. Um, look it up. I, I didn't find it too hard to find a job, but I went straight into teaching. Um, look up what biology you're interested in. And so if you're interested in pharmacology, uh, that will have loads of jobs. If you're into something like ecology, that will have quite a lot of jobs. If you're in something really niche, that might be quite tricky. So if you're only interested in biofilm formation, that might be quite hard to get a job. I don't know. Medicine, yeah, graduate entry, you can do that too. Mercy, uh, no worries. What confirm was confirmational change the induced fit model? Yes. Uh, right, guys, have a lovely afternoon or evening even. If you are going to drop by to the year 13 one, I'll see you then. But otherwise, I'll probably see you in about a week or so. Okay, have a nice one. See you later. Bye.